which can help to support people in uh, understanding the implications of what they're being asked to vote for. All of that, in, all of the, the results of that work will be made uh, public. Uh, they'll be published uh, uh, stage by stage. Um, I would think probably starting early in the new year and then, and then, and then building uh, from there. It would be very helpful to us, I think, if you could let us have a note of what, you, what, as far as you can at this stage, what the subjects are being covered and when we can expect some of these papers to be Do you want to add something to this? Well, no, I, mean, I, I think actually the um, Secretary of State uh, for Scotland answered a question in July, um, setting out the individual strands, um, but we would be happy to come back to you with more yeah. detail. Thank you. What the Chairman has just said, I think that what many of us think is required uh, is something which uh, goes a little bit beyond that. Uh, of course, there are many people uh, in Scotland, or maybe in England, but it's Scotland that matters because that's where the referendum is going to be held. Uh, there are many people in Scotland who say, well, to hell with the economics, we want political independence. That's it. Um, but nevertheless, there will be many others who feel that the economic issues are important. Mm. Uh, we have identified some of them in the questions we've asked you so far, and there may indeed almost certainly are others. Mm. And I think that what people feel, uh, many people feel, is that it would be a grave dereliction of duty if the Treasury were not to produce a single paper uh, analysing, saying these are the economic issues. You first of all identify what the economic issues are. You then analyse uh, these issues that you've identified, and then you reach conclusions on them, uh, on strictly the economic realities. A single paper so everybody can see what the uh, I want to say what the economic issues are and and uh, make their to pass their cast their votes in the light of this and to put things out in dribs and drabs uh, and you know on the one hand on the other hand way you know that's not good enough. Well, it's what we're going to do to start with. You might, I will certainly consider your uh, suggestion over the, uh, over the months to come. I think what we see, I mean, there is going to be a campaign in Scotland. There will be, and I accept this is the, your, your point earlier, that this is of interest outside Scotland, but there will be a, a campaign in Scotland with a group of people arguing uh, the case for independence, a group of people arguing uh, the case uh, uh, against. Um, I think what, where we see our, our role as being centrally important is providing a... Uh, a, 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 a body of uh, facts and analysis, which, as, you, as the chairman pointed out at the start of the, the, the session, and is clear from the, the reasoning behind you establishing this inquiry in the first place, has been lacking in, in this debate. Uh, and I think that is a, 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 a very good and important role that the UK government can uh, can engage in. Um, as to whether uh, some publication. Some, some further publication could then be brought together, um, collecting that in some uh, sort of summary form. That's, a, that's an interesting proposition that I'll certainly take away. Talk to the man. Thank you. Further clarification. There is a campaign in Scotland, and the Scottish people have a right to demand answers to various questions. And I was very struck reading the editorial in The Scotsman this morning and in the Daily Record at the attitude they took to that. And obviously you have a responsibility to provide the Scottish people with information to enable them to take um, a rational decision. But you are a minister of the United Kingdom government, and Sir Nicholas is the head of a United Kingdom department. And we in England don't have the vote in this referendum, um, but we do have a right to information. And it does seem to me that not only ought you to provide information to the Scottish people to enable them to make a rational decision, but you also have a duty to the English and the Welsh and the Northern Irish to provide information that enable us to form a judgment as to what the implications of the decision will be, even though we don't have a vote on it. Well, uh, there are certainly in the, in the um, you know, there is, there is, even if we wish to, there is no way that we could provide information to the people of Scotland and keep it secret from everybody else. 
Um, no, so, but the implications so, so, for us, so, as well as the implications so, for them. Um, the, 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 the information that we produce in terms of uh, the, the, the identifying the issues, identifying uh, the arguments, uh, and um, setting out you know the, 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 the strengths and benefits of the uh, of the uh, of the United Kingdom and the analysis of the issues and, and uh, challenging some of the assertions insofar as any assertions are clearly made, which is quite rare at the moment by the advocates of, of independent. That will be available uh, for, for for everybody to look at. But look, we've accepted uh, uh, as as a uh, as a government. Um, that the people of Scotland have got the right to make this decision for themselves in a in a in a in a, in a referendum. It's a single question referendum asking this asking this question. I think our principal responsibility is to make sure that the decision uh, is taken uh, on the basis of proper evidence and argument. Now we now have a vote. Can I uh, can I just make a comment and ask the committee? We've we've about three other subjects I think that we wanted to cover, but I think we've covered the major ones actually. It might be better for all of us if we put those three questions to you in writing and publish yeah. them uh, with, with the transcript and the evidence. They're not the key ones. We've, I think we've dealt with most of the key ones. Okay, well, that suits so, the committee. I'd be so happy to do could, that. If we could do that, would that be agreeable to all, all members of the committee? If we could do that, we'll do that and then publish them. Okay. But can I thank you very much? I think this has been a really illuminating session. It's covered most of the key issues. Good. I think there's an agreement between us that a lot more information is required, both for Scotland and for the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, but uh, it's been most helpful. You've been very open with the committee. You've clearly stated your own view, and we will certainly use a lot of the information and the discussions we've had today when we go to Edinburgh and Glasgow next week. So thank you both very much indeed for coming. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give evidence. Good morning and welcome to BBC Parliament's live coverage of the House of Commons. And in half an hour's time, David Cameron will be facing the Labour leader, Ed Miliband, for the first Prime Minister's question time. Since the break for the conference season, both leaders received praise for their speeches to their party conferences. Things may not be running quite so smoothly for them today. After that comes the main business in the chamber, which is more debate on the details of the government's enterprise and regulatory reform bill. This aims to strengthen the environment for business and reduce regulatory burdens. Don't forget to join me, Keith McDougall, for a roundup of the day in both the Commons and the Lords in Wednesday in Parliament on this channel at 11 o'clock tonight. First, it's questions to the new Welsh Secretary, David Jones, and his team of ministers. Order, order, 
questions to the Secretary of State for Wales, Jessica Morden. Mr Speaker, with permission, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the dedication and professionalism of David Powers Police and all the other agencies involved in the search for April Jones who went missing on the 1st of October. I'm sure that the whole House will join with me in praising them for their continued work to find April and also the support that has been shown by so many of the people of Machanthath for her family. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Wales Office and the Home Office have been working closely with the Welsh Government and partners to make the Police and Crime Commissioner reforms a success in Wales. Considerable progress has been achieved through the Wales Transition Board. Jessica Morden. Um, I welcome the Secretary of State to his new job. And could I ask him to let us know how much print in the second set of ballot papers for the Police Commissioner elections in Wales will be cost in the, well the Home Office? I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for her welcome. Uh, the situation, Mr Speaker, is, as the House will know, uh, that the order for the bilingual version of the forms was laid on the 15th of October. It is hoped that the process will be completed by the 30th of October. On the question of cost, I shall write to the Honourable Lady. Lynn Davis. Uh, I thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, a, a serious potential problem has been averted over the uh, preparation of voting papers in the Welsh language. But will the uh, Secretary of State engage with the Welsh Language Commissioner to ensure commitment to bilingualism in Wales is fully respected in all non-devolved areas where the problem arose? Yes, Mr Speaker, the Wales Office is committed fully to uh, the Welsh language and its support, not only in the devolved but also in the undevolved areas. I'm pleased to report that my office is working closely with the Welsh Language Commissioner and indeed it is proposed that an official of the Welsh Language Commissioner will be embedded in the Wales Office. Sean James. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know that the Honourable Gentleman is a great proponent of the Welsh language, but I would urge him to ensure that in all aspects and all avenues of work within the Palace of Westminster, that the Welsh language is given the respect it so rightly deserves. And I hope this, thing, you know, this type of thing is not going to happen again. Well, Mr Speaker, the uh, Honourable Lady has identified a problem which does need to be resolved in that the Welsh Language Commissioner, of course, uh, is a position that was created by the Welsh Assembly. It is important that in the non-devolved areas sufficient support should be given to the Welsh language, and I'm pleased to re report that that is a duty that my office is prepared and anxious to undertake. Dr Howell Francis. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I have had regular discussions with ministerial colleagues on issues which affect Wales, including around the future of the steel industry. Dr Howell France. Uh, I thank the Minister for his reply and could I warmly congratulate him and uh, his colleague on their new positions. I believe it was as a consequence of their apprenticeships on the Welsh Affairs Committee. Tata Steel is a, a major investor and uh, employer in my constituency. Nearly £250 million has been invested recently uh, in the steel plant at Port Talbot. And this is largely uh, supported, very strongly supported, by the Welsh Government, the local council, local trade unions and the local management. This is a, a strong regional partnership. What will the Wales Office do to assist uh, the steel industry in these challenging times? Would the Secretary of State speak with uh, his colleague uh, in the Cabinet, the Business Secretary, to address the question of a le level, level playing field uh, in terms of energy costs? And would he visit, would he visit the steel and steelworks in my constituency at the earliest opportunity? Well, I, I thank the Honourable Member for that question and for his, his kind remarks. One of the most enjoyable parts of my first term in Parliament was serving under his chairmanship on the Welsh Affairs Committee. It, we absolutely recognise the strategic importance of Tata as an inward investor into Wales. We have very, very close links with them here at the Wales Office. I will certainly speak to my colleague, the Secretary of State for Business, about what more we can do to support uh, Tata's inward investment. And we, and we do recognise that particular issue around energy costs and that's why we've made available £250 million for intensive energy users and I hope that he and industries in Wales will be making representations about how they can benefit from that money. Fabricant. With my mother coming from Aberavon, I understand too well the importance of the steel industry. 
history, and I congratulate the honourable gentleman for asking the question that he did. Does my honourable friend agree with me, though, that with the great news today that employment is up by 4,000, sorry, 40,000 in Wales, <laughs> and unemployment down by 7,000, that's a good start? Well, the, the labour market statistics for Wales were particularly good today. Unemployment down, worklessness down, and overall employment levels up. They're great reasons to have optimism, but no reason to be complacent whatsoever. Yeah. In Brennan. Number three, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I am committed to working with the Welsh Government to deliver economic growth in Wales. I do not intend political differences to stand in the way of such cooperative working in the interests of Wales. Hey, congratulations to uh, the Right Honourable Member and his friend, as we say in Wales, but when the Prime Minister promised a respect agenda, did he mean trying to block Welsh Assembly legislation, unilaterally abolishing wage protection for agricultural workers in Wales and tearing up a cross-border GCSE exam system without consultation? And if that's the case, can he even spell the word respect? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, by the way, if he doesn't As we say in Wales, Diolcham at Longa Varchadai. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the Honourable Gentleman that this Government is fully committed to the Respect Agenda. We are working closely with the Welsh Government and I am very pleased with the relationship that I am cultivating with Carwyn Jones, the First Minister. TC Davis. Both ministers, who I warmly congratulate, agree with me that PAH, as we say in Monmouthshire, is something that works in both directions, and the refusal of Welsh Assembly ministers to appear before select committees shows a disgraceful lack of respect, not only to this House, but to those of us who were put here by the people of Wales. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the word PAH means respect, and I agree that PAH is a process that works in two directions. I'm very hopeful, Mr Speaker, that a new uh, relationship will be cultivated, not, between the two, not only between the two governments, but also between the uh, parliament, parliament and the Assembly itself. Mr. Peter Hayne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome him to the job? And whilst wishing his predecessor all the best, can I say how good it is to have a Welsh MP as Secretary of State for Wales again? But why on earth is he referring the first two laws passed by the Welsh Assembly under the 2006 Government of Wales Act to the Attorney General? The provision I included in that Act was not to, to allow the Secretary of State to block Welsh legislation. It was primarily to deal with any cross-border issues, which I can't see apply in these cases. Why is he interfering in this anti-devolution manner? Uh, Mr Speaker, could I echo the tribute that the Right Honourable Gentleman paid to my predecessor, who was an excellent Secretary of State? Uh, in terms of the references to the Supreme Court, these are matters that are set out, as he knows, in the Government of Wales Act, which, of course, he was responsible for. Uh, the uh, reference of the first Welsh bill, that is the bylaws bill, uh, to the Supreme Court should not be regarded in, in any sense as either disrespectful or hostile. It is simply an administrative procedure to clear up the issue of competence, and that is it. Mr. Owen Smith. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I first add my words of support uh, to those of the Secretary of State for the David Powys Police and the community of Machantleth as they've lived through the awful events of recent weeks. And may I also warmly congratulate the Secretary of State and his deputy and welcome to their new role. We are thrilled on this side of the House that the Prime Minister finally found a Welsh MP to take on the post. In fairness, his predecessor, whom I didn't always agree with, has found a new spirit of candour in recent weeks since she's left the job and has admitted, for example, that his government has lost all reputation for competence. So on this question of respect, can he continue in this spirit of openness and clear up the question of his attitude to devolution? Could he tell us straightforwardly, does he think devolution has been good for Wales? Mr Speaker, I don't know whether I can carry on accepting all these welcomes. It's far too much for me, but if, uh, I'm sure it will come to an end. But 
I feel... <laughs> I do feel strongly, Mr. Speaker, that the issue of devolution is one that is developing. I think that as the Assembly and as the Assembly Government mature as institutions, they could be very good for, for Wales indeed. And that is why I and my office are determined to work closely with them to assist them in doing our best for Wales with them. Mr. Owen Smith. Mr. Speaker, you forgive me if I think the Secretary of State's view that the Assembly could be good for Wales is hardly a ring endorsement of the devolution settlement that was so decisively supported by the Welsh people. Isn't the reality that his view that the devolution settlement has damaged our constitution and his deputy's view that it's constitutional vandalism is what they really think and where they really have disrespect for devolution? Isn't the truth that he can't speak for modern Wales, devolved Wales, but on this side of the House we can and we will. When I use the word could, Mr Speaker, I intended to point out that under the Labour Assembly Government, coupled with 10 years plus of Labour Government here in London, we have seen Wales as the poorest part of the United Kingdom. I believe that a lot more could be done to make Wales a happier place to live. And for that purpose, it's necessary for us in the Wales office to work closely with the Welsh Assembly Government. I'm willing to do that. I hope he would support me. Salute. Yeah, yeah. Or, oh, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, I am strongly committed to working with the Welsh Government to encourage private sector investment and growth in Wales, including promoting enterprise zones in Wales. Yeah, yeah. Andrew Salou. Um, isn't it important that there's a much closer working relationship between the governments in London and Cardiff in respect of enterprise zones so we can make faster progress in creating jobs and wealth in Wales? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is exactly right. Is it vital that the two governments, UK Government and Welsh Government in Cardiff, work together on a range of issues, not least the success of enterprise zones. I'm committed to doing that and I'm very much looking forward to my first meeting with the Welsh Business Minister Edwina Hart shortly. Mr Grant Davis. Yes, you'll be aware that uh, the Bristol Enterprise Zone, uh, alongside the tolls uh, on the gateway to the South Wales economy, is a, a major impediment to inward investment and growth. Will he therefore ask colleagues in the Treasury to commission a study to see if a reduction in the tolls would be more than compensated by increase in income tax from new jobs by inward investment. Well, my, my colleague, the Right Honourable uh, Secretary of State, will be discussing the issue of tolls on the Seven Bridge this, this afternoon with the Secretary of State for Transport. No decisions have been made beyond 20, 2018 when the current concession ends, and clearly there's a lot to discuss about how we uh, maximise the benefits of inward investment in Wales. Jonathan Evans. Grateful, Mr Speaker. Does my honourable friend agree that the objectives of the Cardiff Central uh, Enterprise Zone are much more likely to be realised now that the Coalition Government have granted an £11 million grant to the City of Cardiff to make it one of the most digitally connected cities in the world? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, the honourable member is exactly right. The £11.7 million that we've made available to Cardiff to support their development as a super connected city will make Cardiff one of the most digitally advanced cities in the United Kingdom and we look forward to that helping leverage in new business investment into Cardiff City. Nia Griffith. Well, Mr Speaker, I certainly uh, very much welcome the Minister's positive words about the Welsh Assembly Government's work with enterprise zones and indeed full cooperation on matters to help the economy. But could he also join with me in congratulating Welsh Assembly Government Ministers for creating 1,700 youth jobs in the last six months to try and tackle the scourge of underlying youth unemployment in Wales? And will he tell his Cabinet and front bench colleagues how Wales is leading the way on this and that they should never have got rid of the Future Jobs Fund? Well, I thank the Shadow Minister for, for that question. And any new jobs that are created that will tackle long term youth unemployment in Wales, I welcome. I'm just disappointed that she's not welcoming the news today that unemployment has fallen in Wales, employment levels are up, and worklessness is down. Alan Cairns. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Enterprise zones are a fantastic success in England, uh, although the success in Wales has been somewhat uh, limited. Enhanced capital allowances can play a significant part in attracting inward investment to the 
enterprise zones. Therefore, is the, my uh, honourable friend, uh, uh, does he, is, does, is he somewhat disappointed and dismayed that the Welsh Government have not sought to communicate with the Treasury where they would like to bring this tax advantage in Wales? Well, the discussions about the use of, ent uh, of enhanced capital allowance in conjunction with other forms of regional aid are continuing with colleagues in the Treasury, but we are very much looking forward to seeing some specific proposals from the Welsh Minister about how they would see enterprise zones developing in Wales. Madeline Moon. The most enterprising company in my constituency, Biotech Services International, is being stopped from developing because they cannot get export licences for growth hormones from the Home Office. I've written to the Home Office. Would the Minister take an interest in this matter so that this unique Welsh company doesn't lose its opportunity to grow and development for Wales? Well, I'm concerned to hear that from the Honourable Lady. I note that she's written to the relevant Minister, but if she'd like to write to me as well, I will certainly look into it and see that she gets all of her questions answered. Aaron Lumley. Number five, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm working with UK TI ministerial colleagues and the Welsh Government to improve levels of inward investment into Wales. In fact, I'm meeting, meeting the Chief Executive of UK TI later today. Please. Mr Speaker, does my, my friend agree with me, though, that scrapping of the Welsh Development Agency has had a negative effect on inward investment to Wales, as highlighted by the, well, recently by the Welsh Fair Select Committee? Well, well it's true, Mr Speaker, that under the... Uh, under the Welsh Development Agency, Wales was regularly the most uh, important destination for inward investment. But I do support both governments working closely together to continue to attract inward investment into Wales. Elfin Fluid. Mr Speaker, may I first of all warmly associate myself and my colleagues with the remarks of the Right Honourable Gentleman regarding David Powers Police and all the emergency services who are now looking for little April Jones. Can I also congratulate him and the Under Secretary on their appointments? What assessment has he made of the loss to Wales of inward investment since the disappearance of the Welsh Development Agency brand? And who has the last word on inward investment, uh, this government or the government in Wales? Well, I think it's absolutely clear, as the Right Honourable Gentleman says, that Wales does need a strong brand in order to promote itself around the world. And it's clear also that although uh, economic development is devolved to uh, the Assembly Government, it does need to have the uh, leverage that it will get from UKTI. And that is why I'm encouraging the Welsh Government to work closely with UKTI. Government had with the Welsh Government regarding the establishment of a dedicated trade promotion agency, uh, either sitting within the Welsh Government or as a private sector vehicle, as recommended by the Welsh Affairs Committee back in February. Well, I have regular discussions with the Welsh Government about inward investment, and I would hope that the Welsh Minister for Business is giving consideration to that very thing. Mark Williams. Academic research and uh, development and its commercialisation is a key ingredient to inward investment. I'm, I'm heartened that the Secretary of State is meet, meeting UKTI later today. Can you impose on them the excellent work that's been take, undertaken in Bangor, in Glendua University, in Aberystwyth and Swansea? We've got a good message to sell and we need UKTI to help us sell it. Yes, Mr Speaker, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Welsh universities do have a good tale to tell. And I would like to single out Swansea University on their science campus, which it is developing closely with British and international industry. Ian Lucas, Disabli Disability Employment Limited of Stoke want to inwardly invest in Wrexham to put disabled workers sat by this government back to work. Will the Secretary of State come to Wales a week, come to Wrexham a week on Friday to meet disabled workers from Remploy to explain to them why the government will not support this company. As uh, the Honourable Gentleman will know, the Government's policy on Remploy is to provide supported jobs in mainstream employment. I've had discussions with him previously about this issue. I'm entirely happy to have further discussions with him if he requires. As to Friday, I can't make any commitments because I haven't got my diary. Order. There are far too many noisy private conversations taking place in the Chamber. Let's have a bit of order for Carl McCartney. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Question six. 
My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Wales, has regular discussions with the Secretary of State for Education. And for clarity, Ofqual is the independent regulator of qualifications in England. It's the Welsh Government which regulates qualifications in Wales. Oh, McCartney. Thank you. Does the Minister share my concern that a dangerous precedent is set when ministers take it upon themselves to mark exam papers? Yeah. Well, the Honourable Member makes his point, and um, a lot has been said about that, and I don't want to add to that today, other than to say it was un unfortunate the Welsh Government acted unilaterally on this matter. The key point is the ongoing review into qualifications in Wales and the proposals from my Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State, for new qualifications at 16 in England. And it's important that parents and pupils in Wales have confidence that their qualifications will be respected, will be robust, and they'll be able to take them to institutions and employers in England. And, have, and they'll be respected. Yeah. Number seven, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with permission, spe Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions seven and nine together. I have regular discussions with ministerial colleagues about attracting for foreign direct investment into Wales, and I was delighted that during his visit to Turkey earlier this month, my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, announced that a Turkish steel company is opening a new factory in Cardiff. Shailesh Bara. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for those comments. Would he agree with me that through UKTI's global presence, through our embassies and high commissions, there is a huge opportunity to ensure that there is in Wales direct foreign investment. Yeah. Yes, Mr Speaker, UKTI has global reach with uh, UKTI officials embedded in every British uh, mission around the world. Uh, and I'm delighted that UKTI itself is seconding two officials to the Welsh Government. Mr Simon Hart. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Speaker, the Secretary State will know that one reason foreign companies don't invest in West Wales is due to overburdensome planning restrictions. Could he use his influence within the Welsh Assembly to sweep away these obstacles? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm sure that uh, my honourable friend is pleased to hear that the Welsh uh, Government has de designated uh, his, uh, the local enterprise zone in Milford Haven. Um, yes, indeed, planning is extremely important for the development of enterprise zones. These are being streamlined in England, and I very much hope that the Welsh Government will be following suit. Mr Albert Owen, Speaker. Can I welcome the Secretary of State, so whether he be overwhelmed by the amounts he's had thus far, but to, will he encourage ministers to look at improving infrastructure in Wales, in particular port infrastructure, and it, an enterprise zone such as Anglesey relies on this. He has passed the buck in the past to the Welsh Assembly. Now will he fight within government so they have a level playing field with English ports? Well, Mr Speaker, ports, of course, are an undevolved area, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to say to the Honourable Gentleman that I do regard Holyhead Port as an important anchor of the uh, Anglesey economy, uh, and that, indeed, I hope very shortly to be visiting Captain Wynne Parry in Anglesey Port. Mr Nick Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The proposed motorsport investment in Evervale could be an employment game-changer for Blaine Grant. The international developers are seeking variable investment allowances. Can I urge the Secretary of State to get the Treasury on board now for a fair tax treatment to help deliver this project? Mr Speaker, enhanced capital allowances are an extremely important element of enterprise zones. They have already been granted in the case of the D-side enterprise zone, and we are urging the Welsh Government to make appropriate representations to HM Treasury to see them extended to other enterprise zones, such as the one in his constituency. Order. Chris Evan. Number eight, Mr Speaker. Information on the expected impact in Wales and across Great Britain on our, of our housing benefit reforms is set out in the impact assessments. We are taking urgent steps to manage housing benefit expenditure, providing a fairer and more sustainable scheme by ensuring people who receive it have to make the same choices about their housing as people who do not. Chris Evan, would the Secretary of State please explain why 17-year-old Shanika Roberts, who faces being made homeless because of this government's cuts to housing in benefit should move in with their friend. Well, 
£21 billion is being spent on housing benefit, and that figure will go up without the reforms that we're putting in place. And I would just ask the Honourable Member, what is fair about 100,000 people in Wales languishing on waiting lists, often in cramped accommodation, when other people are living in houses with empty rooms larger than their needs? Seven billion pounds is spent on benefits in Wales every year, and nearly one pound in eight of that one billion pounds is spent on housing benefit alone. Isn't the taxpayer entitled to expect value for money? Absolutely, the taxpayers expect, uh, can expect value for money, and I hope that the honourable member will appreciate the fruit of our, of our welfare reforms coming through in Wales, as borne out by the labour market statistics today. Mr Speaker, I have regular discussions with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, about a range of transport is issues affecting Wales, including the importance of investing in rail infrastructure. He took bed. Can I thank yeah. the Secretary of State for his answer and warmly congratulate him on his new position? And can I also congratulate the Secretary of State and his predecessor for the electrification of the South Wales Railway Network, which was something that the Labour Party failed to achieve yeah. in 30 years. Yeah. Part of the transport to look at the possibilities of new signalling of the North Wales Main Line. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I did in fact meet with Network Rail earlier this month to discuss their plans for the rail network in Wales, including the re-signalling programme. The North Wales Main Line is due to be re-signalled commencing in 2015 as part of the Wales route modernisation. Oh, Williams, Speaker, how much of the £9.4 billion going to be spent on rail infrastructure up to 2019 is going to be spent in North Wales? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure that the Honourable Gentleman will be pleased to hear that I'm already holding discussions with both the Welsh Government and local authorities in North Wales with a view to exploring the possibility of electrification of the North Wales railway line. 105 miles, an enormous economic benefit for North Wales. Mr Speaker, I welcome the announcement for extra capital ex expenditure, but will the Secretary of State work with the Welsh Assembly to make sure that Welsh civil engineering companies have uh, help in in competing for contracts for this work. Yes, Mr Speaker, this is an issue that has been identified recently. I'm sure that the Welsh Government are aware of the problem and I'm sure that they will be addressing it. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr William Bain. Number one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will wish to join me in paying tribute to the servicemen who have tragically fallen since we last met for Prime Minister's questions. Lance Corporal Dwayne Groom of 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, Sergeant Gareth Thursby and Private Thomas Rowe of the 3rd Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, Sergeant Jonathan Coops of the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, Captain James Townley of the Royal Engineers and Captain Carl Manley of the Royal Marines. Once again, we are reminded of the immense danger our armed forces operate in to uphold our safety and our security. Their families and the whole country should rightly be proud of their heroic service, and we will always remember them. Amen. The House, I am sure, will also wish to join me in paying tribute to PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes, who were killed, brutally murdered, in the line of duty on the 18th of September. The whole country has been deeply shocked and saddened by the loss of these two young, dedicated, exceptional officers. Our thoughts are with their families and with their colleagues at what must be a very, very difficult time. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I also know the House would wish to join me in sending our heartfelt condolences to the family of Malcolm Wicks, who sadly passed away on the 29th of September. I think all sides of this House will remember Malcolm as a real gentleman, a man of great integrity and compassion, who put his constituents first, who worked across party lines, and who was a thoroughly decent man. Yeah. He served the House with great distinction for 20 years, and I know he'll be missed by all who knew him. Mr Speaker, we must also pay tribute to another of Parliament's great characters, and it's hard not to believe that he's not sitting right there in front of me, Sir Stuart Bell. Sir Stuart was hugely popular uh, across the House and was honoured for his services to Parliament. I think we'll always remember him as a passionate, dedicated member of the House who, again, his kindness transcended the political divide. We send our sincere sympathies to his wife and family at this difficult time. 
Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr William Bay. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate all honourable and right honourable members with the Prime Minister's tribute to the members of the armed forces and the police who have died in the service of our country and to their families? And also